Okay, so in that last video, um, we talked about two things. We talked about input size, which we usually capture with this variable n, and that might be something like the size of a list or the length of a string or the size of a file. I mean, it could be a lot of different things, uh, but we have the input size. And, um, and then we had, well, how many steps do I have to do? And we thought carefully about how we could define our steps, like what is a step? And uh, then once we kind of define them, it's a little bit easier to go through and count how many um, steps will get executed when we run um, our program, right? Some steps might be executed once, once some might be executed many times that, you know, varying uh, depending on the size of the input. And so now what we want to do is kind of connect these things a little bit more formally. We have this idea that the number of steps is a function of the input size and um, and so really we kind of, for any piece of code, we could get this function that's relating those two things, relating the input size and the number of steps. And we want to have a mathematical way of, of kind of categorizing these functions, right? To say, well, how fast does it grow? How, um, how does the amount of work I have to do scale up as the data scales up? And, and this notation is called big O notation. Um, it's one of the more mathematical things we'll do in this course. Um, uh, and it turns out, though, that it's actually something I see a lot in, in practice. Um, for example, um, later in the semester when we're learning about machine learning algorithms, um, there's going to be the documentation for those. And those will often be defining the performance or cost of running an algorithm uh, using this big O notation that we're about to learn. right? And so you need to be able to read that. Um, even if you kind of aren't developing new algorithms, how can you choose the right tools? right? Because it's going to talk about big O notation uh, in the documentation, or this other one here. Here's another one. Um, you can see that this one has a lot of complexity, right? We want to be able to understand uh, this language to be able to figure out what we want to use. Um, now, another advantage of this is that um, these kinds of questions come up a lot uh, in interviews. I maybe I've maybe had like a dozen tech interviews in my life, and I would say uh, most of them will ask me to write some code to solve some sort of problem. And I'd say about half of them, after they do that, will follow up question, which is, tell me the big O no complexity um, of your code, right? So this is kind of uh, a little bit more technical, but it's going to be practical too, and it will help you with interviews. Okay, so, right, we care about classifying these functions that relate input size to the number of steps. And, um, and so down below, I'm actually showing a picture of one of these functions, right? I mean, I can draw each function as a line, like I'm doing on the x-axis I have size n, and on the y-axis I have f of n, which is the number of steps. And, um, and and so really, like when I'm trying to classify functions, you could think I'm, I'm really trying to classify them by the shape of the lines that they make when we plot them. And, and when we're trying to classify them as part of this theory, uh, there's things that we care about and things that we don't care about. Um, one is that I, I'm not going to care about um, the scale of the y-axis. And, um, and, and the reason I don't care about that is you already saw that there was this fuzziness in terms of how I count steps, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's easy for you to look at the same code I'm looking at and, and kind of you identify twice as many steps. And, um, and so when we're counting, right, I mean, it would be easy to change that scale, right? Maybe my goes from zero to a thousand, yours goes from zero to two thousand. And, and so we kind of, in this theory, we want to take that out. Uh, we're also not going to care about um, small inputs, although that might matter in practice, not a part of this theory. The only thing we really care about is the shape of that curve, right? Is it a, is it a flat line? Is it a curved line? Is it sharply curved? And, and so the kind of the way we're going to define the shape of it or kind of describe it is we're going to try to find a simpler function that's an upper bound on it. And, and so for each of these upper bounds, that's going to be a set of functions, right? So the set of functions that go with an upper bound are the set of functions that uh, will roughly stay on underneath it. Okay. So let me just give an example. So that first line I plotted was 2n squared plus 100. And if I plot the n squared line, that is clearly not an upper bound, right? It's smaller. Uh, but remember, I don't care about the scale. So the fudge factor I'm going to be allowed is I can multiply n squared by anything I want. So um, let's say I'll multiply it by 3. I can do that so I kind of get uh, 3n squared. And, and I can also define a crossover point and say only look to the right of that. And, and so what you can see now is that 
the black line is underneath the three n squared line for big n values. And, and so what that's gonna let me do is I'm gonna be able to say that um, this two n squared plus 100 function is in this class. It's in the order n squared class. That's what I'm gonna say. And, and of course, f of n, right, is associated with some sort of algorithm. So eventually I'm going to get back to, I can actually say that some sort of um, algorithm is an order n squared algorithm. Well, let's get a little bit more precise here. Okay, so I, I, I'm defining big O notation in, in terms of this uh, if and then. And, and ultimately I want to make the if or the then part, right? I want to end up saying that um, f of n, which is a function, is inside of the order g of n class. And, and so this little symbol here, right, that means set membership, right? So the, the big O part, I, I think of that as a, as a set of functions, and I'm saying f of n is in it. Now, it, it's kind of strange um, sometimes, and maybe in the majority of times when you see this, people will use an equal sign. I think that's more confusing uh, and a little deceptive, so I'm not gonna do that. So I'm just gonna say that f of n um, is in that. And so to make that claim, what do I have to show? I have to show this first part. I have to show that f of n, f of n is beneath some constant factor times g of n. Right, that's the caring about the shape of the curve part. And when I'm trying to show this, I can introduce two constraints. I can say that I don't care about small inputs, which means I'm allowed, if I'm trying to make this claim, I, I can say that this is the minimum n value, only look at bigger numbers. And, and I don't care about the scale, right? So I can multiply g of n by whatever I want to, okay? So this is what I'm gonna to try to show. I'm going to, I'm trying to make a claim about what class f of n is in. I'm gonna choose a c value and an n value and, uh, and then show that the function is underneath that. Okay, so you should think about all of these sets, right? Order one, order n, order n squared, um, as, as kind of these, you can think of it as a Venn diagram where each circle is inside of the other one, right? Um, of course, the n squared line is underneath the n cubed line. Of course, the n line is inside of the n, n, n squared line. And so I have kind of all these sets. And, and then you can see I'm plotting um, f of n equals two n squared. That's going to be in the n squared set. And, and since it's in that, it's also by definition in the n, n cube set. All right, so that's the way you should kind of think about it. Now, if I ask what is the complexity of 2n squared, this means there's lots of correct answers, right? You could say n cube, that is true, uh, but it's not very informative, right? You want to give me the most information, which is really means finding the smallest set that contains it. So even though, you know, if I asked what is 2n squared, even though it's correct to say it's in the order n cubed, a better answer is order n squared. And that's the answer you have to give, at least in this class, to get credit, right? You have to give me the most restrictive answer that you're able to give. Okay, so I have a bunch of examples here, and let's just kind of think through each of these, how it's going to work. Okay, how can I, how can I kind of say um, whether it's true or false. So I'm gonna open up this again. Let me let me hide this, the slide only. And um, so is this true? Is 2n inside of order n? And so if I wanna, well, first off it is. So let's say I think it is. To actually prove it, to convince you, um, I need to come up with both a c and an n value. And um, and so to kind of convert this, right, I'm trying to go backwards to prove it, right? And so what I want to do is I want to try to show that this is true. It's less than order, well, it's less than to something times n, c times n. And, um, and I can choose c to be whatever I want, right? So I'm going to say 3, right? So 2n is less than 3n. So I satisfy that. This is indeed, you know, my function is in the in the order n, right? And that's actually true regardless of um, of of how large n is, right? I mean, when we say for large n values, that's because sometimes there's a crossover point. For this one, there's not even a crossover point. This is just true in general. 
Um, what about this next one? I want to show this one is true. So maybe let me just make a note here. That's true. What about this next one? Okay, if I want to show that this is true, right, 100n is inside of n squared, um, what can I do? Um, well, there's different ways I could do it. So is it less than this? I make that true. Well, one way I could do it is I could put that c on front and I could have c be 100. Then it would be true. That would be one way to prove it. Um, another way I could prove it is I could say uh, I could require n to be greater than 100, right? I mean, let's say, let's say n is 101. 100 times 101 is less than 101 times 101, right? And, and so you can kind of see when I'm trying to prove these things, sometimes I, I might use the c factor or I might set a lower bound on n, but either way I can make my point an end and, and prove that the function uh, is in that set. Okay, and, and, there, and there's no real um, bonus points for having height bounds, right? I mean, I could have just as easily made my argument by saying n is greater than a thousand. That's a perfectly fine answer. All right, so this one is also true. Uh, what about, sorry for the font there. Um, what about this last one? Is n squared, is n squared in this? And the answer is it's not. Right, and I'm not trying to give a very formal proof, but let, let me kind of give you the intuition here. For n squared, it's a curved line, right? It's a quadratic function. It's trying to keep curving up and it's trying to get steeper and steeper and steeper. This, one million times n, is a straight line. Right, it's a straight line. And if I multiply a straight line by some constant factor, guess what, it's still a straight line. Okay, so this, this n squared, will eventually, after some crossover point, be above the straight line, right? So this does not fit underneath this, right? So this part is false. I'm gonna just say false right here. Okay, the first two, first two are true, and the, the third one is false. I'm just gonna put this back to kind of keep my uh, slides clean here. And then, then I have some more, um, more problems of this of this nature All right so let's go to the next slide okay and, and you can see i'm just plotting what i just talked about right that it's a straight line that that will always eventually be underneath the curved line okay what about this one here um well the first one's pretty simple right i think that you know n squared we're always when we're talking about input sizes right that's a uh, positive numbers, right? So you should always keep in mind we're dealing with positive numbers. When I'm dealing with positive numbers, well, of course, um, you know, n squared plus n plus one is going to be bigger than n squared. Okay, that one's very simple. I don't even have to have either of my fudge factors, my c or my n. Uh, what about this one? Uh, is n squared plus n plus one inside of n squared? So let me just make a note here. Right? This first one is true. Um, it turns out the second one is true as well, and and the way I can do that is by, it's a little bit more reasoning, but I can say that my fudge factor will be 3 times um, n squared. Uh, and, um, and, and why does that, let me actually just add a note down here, this one's true. Why, why does that help me? Why does that prove my point? Well, because since I have 3 n squared and I have 3 terms over here, well, n squared equals n squared n squared is bigger than n, n squared is bigger than, than one, right? So, so when I multiply this by three, I can make that, uh, that work out. Okay, what about this one? This one is false, right? Because I have this, this polynomial on the right, it's of a higher order, right? When I have n to the fifth, that's just gonna curve more sharply than any of these things that are of a lower, of a lower order. Right, so that one's going to be false. All right, so let me just kind of clean this up for when I save my uh, slides here at the end. Right. 
Oops, and you can kind of see that, right? There's no, no constant factor that's going to make that one true. Now, we're going to want to simplify in po when possible. So, for example, in that first one, right, I said that n squared um, is of the order n squared plus n plus 1. Better answer is just say it's of n squared, right? So minimize when possible. Okay, so what we're going to be going into next is we're going to be looking at actual algorithms. How, how can we tie this all together? All right, so remember that f of n is what relates the input size to the number of steps for a particular um, al algorithm. And so just a bit of a note on notation here, right? I've been doing kind of all stuff like this where I say that this function is in order of something. And when I say that algorithm A is in the order of something, I'm just saying that that corresponding f of n for that algorithm is in it, right? So it's kind of a, this is kind of a shorthand where I actually don't actually um, explicitly define f. Okay, so let's look at a piece of code here, right? So we had this example before, and we saw that uh, for an input size of n, we would have 2 times n plus 3 steps, right? So my f of n equals 2n plus 3, and that 2n plus 3 is less than or equal to 3n. So 3 is my fudge factor c. And that's true for big n values. Therefore, this piece of code uh, is order n, right? If I go to this other version I had, right? So before, remember when I had this version, kind of depending on whether they're even or odd, I might have 2n plus 5 or 4n plus 5 steps. I'm going to go with the worst case scenario. And guess what? 4n plus 5 is less than or equal to 5 times n for big n values. Therefore, the code is order n. And so you can kind of see this elegance of introducing these fudge factors, right? Because when I'm counting steps and there's this flexibility in how I do it, I can be off by a constant factor. By bringing back in a c, I'm going to ultimately get the same complexity in the end. So the, the kind of this theory of, of constant factors means that I don't have to worry as much about how I count my, my steps. So in the next piece, I'll actually do some more um, examples, but I'll kind of break off there for now.